Hey, Brambro back with some more Grand Tactician Civil War. We're in a CSA campaign in the 1.06. And I haven't loaded into the game yet uh, because uh, we, we got a lot of comments on the last uh, episode or two. And uh, as I have been doing recently, I want to address some comments. Uh, it's getting to be too many. You know, I really can't address them all anymore. <laughs> It'd be a two-hour episode. Uh, but uh, one comment I got was, Hey, can you go over uh, and, and show your game options? And uh, so that's why I haven't loaded in yet, so that uh, if there's any that I can't change in-game, I can change them now. But uh, yeah, we can do that. And I've just verified the files on the game, which I do every... A couple episodes or so. So they've all reset the default. So 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 here's what it looks like on default. And uh, I really don't change too much in here. Uh, same 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 thing. Um, I usually unclick the downsizing of units in large battles because my rig seems to handle it. And uh, I like just the look of it. And, uh, and I usually bump up this model's uh, a little bit. Uh, seems to work okay. I don't go all the way to high. Now, I leave historical fonts off. I like the idea of it. And it is off by default and probably should be. But, you know, after the novelty of it wears off, it's just a little hard to read <laughs> for me. Um... When I'm playing by myself, I generally like to uh, bring the UI scale down, just so there's more of the screen free. But for recording purposes, uh, I just leave it in the middle because I want it big enough, you know, to be visible in the video for the viewers. Uh, but by the same token, you know, if you go like up this way it just gets it just blocks out too much of the screen so I just leave this kind of in the middle maybe maybe a hair on the small side uh, I like the tooltip time appearance to be it it's already way short by default but I even like to get it even faster than that because I look at them a lot I like to bring the uh, the scroll speeds down it does slow things down a little bit but if it's if it's too fast, I, I you know I, I find it hard with the WASD keys to center on what I'm trying to look at, you know, and I'm going back and forth and back and forth trying to get it centered on one unit. Uh, and I kind of like the the zooms uh, a little slower for the same reason. I do like to lock the rotations in place. This only locks rotation with the mouse. Like when you bump up against the edge of the screen, it blocks rotation with that. You can still rotate the map when you intend to rotate the map using the, the Q and E keys. So you can still rotate, it's just when you want to, not when you track your mouse against the edge of the screen. Uh, movement panel delay. I, personally, I think this should be default off. This movement panel is, you know, you give an order, and this on either the campaign or the tactical map, and you get that little uh, icon for the movement uh, options. Like, do you want to use railroad? Do you want to use river um, on the campaign map? Or do you want to advance or fall back on the tactical map okay and then you know if you don't move quickly enough that little panel goes away and your movement is locked in and you didn't get to make the choice that you wanted to make and that is a source of frustration on the default settings so at very least you know one would you know I, I want that option there long but you can bypass this entirely by just turning them off. Boom. And that way you kind of have to. <laughs> you actually have to close that little panel. <laughs> so I much prefer it this way. 
Uh, quick info, I don't even know exactly what that is. I've never turned it off. Um, I like the newspaper headlines, right? They give a nice clue on when something happens. Hey, you researched a policy. Hey, the union did this, the union did that. <laughs> eh, sometimes I do this pause if panels are closed, sometimes I don't. I usually leave it off. Uh, I turn the music, I, I don't turn the music all the way down. I used to because I wasn't 100% sure about copyright issues on the videos. Uh, I like for it to be audible, but, you know, I don't want it drowning me out. So I usually put it somewhere down in this area. Um, I, I, de I deactivate the chapter videos. They're fun to watch the first time you play the game. After that, they, they drag on for a while. Um, occasionally in the past I have uh, left it turned on because I wasn't exactly sure or I turned it back on because I wasn't exactly sure when the next chapter happened um, and in one campaign I uh, actually went a couple of months <laughs> <laughs> when I thought I couldn't research any more of my desired policies, and in fact I could have, I just didn't know that Chapter uh, 3 had started. Chapter 3 starts in November 1862, by the way. Now I know that, and so I've got them turned back off. Um, okay, these game options here, these are actually set at the beginning of the campaign. Right? I, so I have the option to turn them on and off now, but when I load the game in, these will go back to whatever I had set at the beginning of this campaign. Which I believe they're all turned on for that one. I always say, yeah, I've never turned European Intervention off. I mean, they typically never happen anyway unless the player really pursues it. Uh, yeah, I leave the Commander Initiative on. Sometimes they do dumb things. Sometimes they kind of do something that I would have liked for them to do. So, anyway. Um, and about half the time I play with the VP, continuous VP on, half the time I don't. Frankly, I, I've never seen that it makes much of a difference. I mean, you can see the difference. You get the very gradual victory points from holding objectives or not. I'm, I'm not saying there's no difference. It's it's just that the victory points from objectives are a fairly minor part of battle outcomes. They just are. They're not that important. Um, what I find useful about the objectives is it gives, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of what the enemy is likely to do during that initial deployment and setup. You kind of know where he's going to go or where he's going to defend, mostly. Uh, that's the main value of the objectives as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the victory points from objectives, whether this is clicked or not, is far less important than the other uh, victory point categories, which are casualties, routes, and uh, morale. Okay, Those are way more important than objectives are. So whether this is clicked on or off, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, in this campaign that I were about to load in, uh, it is turned on. I leave the autosaves at defaults and I leave all of the uh, hotkeys, which aren't, there aren't very many, uh, but uh, I'll leave all these on whatever their default is as well. And really, a lot of these are just kind of preference thing, but the, but the one thing I do, I want to go back and emphasize this again because I know that this irritates a lot of people, and they may not be no, they may not know uh, that you can turn off that uh, movement panel disappearing real quick, or at very least, you can make it stay on the screen a lot longer. Okay. Load in the game. I 
think I turned that uh, I've turned that music down a little bit too much. <laughs> So one thing worth mentioning very much with regard to Grand Tactics and Civil War is that we are currently playing in 1.06, specifically 1.0635, and that is the live version of the game, not beta. Um, as I'm recording this less than 24 hours ago, uh, earlier today, um, uh, 1.07 has become publicly available uh, on Steam in beta. And so they're continuing to work on the game. And if you're interested in checking out the newest uh, update, uh, it's already available. You, you just, uh, in Steam, you just uh, go into the files and or you know you go into the properties uh, of Grand Tactician and there's a tab in there for betas and you choose dev branch uh, or dev version development version something like that it'll be pretty obvious uh, there's not a code you know there's a window there for input code but there's no code required you just click that let it load on Steam and then off you go you're playing the beta 1.07 uh, there's not that much in it yet, but uh, there's some battle AI fixes in there that I think many people have been long awaiting, and uh, and then there's some other bug fixes as well, and so that's available now for those who would like to explore that. Um, I am going to continue this series in the 1.06 live version, because... I considered transitioning it to the beta, but, you know, it's a beta. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of updates that, along the way with it. There's probably going to be some bugs, and uh, I'm going to keep this series stable. And then when this series is done, uh, there will have no doubt been more things added to the 1.07 by then. And so... Whether it's beta, still in beta, or has gone live by then, uh, the next campaign will be 1.07 in whatever form it may be at that time. And that may be that may still be a while because you know this campaign is kind of still got a lot of time left to go. Okay, uh, let's see what other comments have we gotten. Quite a few, and I'm not going to discuss all of them. Uh, there have been a lot of comments, ideas about things to do in the campaign. Like, you know, can you do a cavalry force uh, that can go back get behind the lines and raid? Um, maybe now's the time to get a whole bunch of guys, uh, all these uh, small units in the Indian territory together and form a corps and go off and do stuff with that. Um, you know, move this unit there, move this... You know, that unit uh, over to this other place. Um, and they're all good ideas. Uh, pretty much everything that I've read along that along those lines, uh, I think, are good ideas. That doesn't mean I'm going to do them all. <laughs> it's one campaign. There's only so much I can do. Um, but uh, I thought, you know, pretty much everything I read, I thought were really nice ideas. And... I may do some of them in this campaign or some form of them in this campaign. And even if I don't, I may do those things in future campaigns. One person had a question. Uh, I, I happen to have the, the leaders visible on the screen. And there was a question about what do these little arrows mean? And I don't know if I've ever talked about that. And one reason I haven't talked about that is... Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand it myself. I'm like, let's look here at Edward Johnson. He has all of these little green up arrows by each trait. And kind of uncharacteristic for this game, there's not a tooltip here. 
They do a pretty good job with tooltips in this game, informative ones. But for some reason, there's no tooltip here saying exactly what that does. I'm pretty sure what this means. I've always gone under the assumption this is what this means. That if you have a green up arrow, that means that Edward Johnson, Allegheny Johnson, um, has is still growing in these stats, right? He's still improving in an. It, well, it, he's lucky. He's got all of them going. Um, so he's continuing to improve. And then if you get the red down arrow, I guess it means he's actually decreasing. Or at very least, is not further improving. Let's see if there's anybody like that. Yeah, okay, so Rams are here. He's still uh, got more room to grow uh, and is growing in fame, apparently, but is kind of stymied on the other attributes. That seems odd. The other commanders in this division are still on the uptick. And I'm sure Ramser can improve beyond this. I think this may be happening. I, I think it may be showing this because I just very recently put Ramsor in command of this brigade. And I'm not 100% sure that I have actually advanced time since I put Ramser in command of this brigade. So maybe once time gets rolling, uh, this may change. The rate at which these attributes increase is influenced by some small degree by their bosses, right? So we've got uh, Joe Johnston up here and his stats kind of flow down the chain. And if you hover, now, the, the arrow does not have a tooltip, but the attribute does. And you can see there, well... So Kirby Smith is actually getting a little bit of... He's still increasing. He's got the green arrow. However, the rate at which he is increasing in initiative is actually nerfed a little bit by the fact that Joe Johnston is his boss. Because Joe Johnston is, is good in quite a few areas, but not in initiative. <laughs> He's only a one star. Smith is actually two stars in initiative. And being under Johnston is kind of retarding his growth. In that one attribute. Well, and it looks like he's actually getting a very tiny bit slowed down in... Uh, leadership as well hmm on the other hand Johnson is very good in cunning and Smith is got a pretty nice little buff going there for the rate at which he is increasing his own cunning so that's my understanding of how this works And that is another good reason to go ahead and use the uh, organization reform and institute the uh, Army Corps structure. Because right now, you know, like, you know, Buckner is getting the benefit or the uh, malice <laughs> sometimes of two commanders above him. Once this goes uh, and the Shenandoah army is, becomes a core in a larger army, that hasn't happened yet, there will be three commanders whose stats are, are flowing, trickling downhill, right? So the brigade commanders uh, will be influenced by three officers above them, not two. And that's another good reason, you know, to 
pay some attention to putting better officers in division, corps, and later army level command. Okay, enough about that. <clears throat> in the last campaign, or rather, I'm oh, sorry, the last episode, we saw a federal army come down this way, and once he got down to somewhere around here, our little gunboats lost sight of him. So there's an army down here, and someone had a good idea about, well, can you run a gunboat up this river to go maybe get sight of him again? And I think the answer is no, because not all rivers are navigable. A lot of these smaller rivers, you can't move naval forces on them. And here's a good example of right here. Cumberland River, you see how it's thicker through here? So this is navigable in here. But you reach this point where you can kind of tell graphically right here, bah, you know, so a gunboat or any other fleet, river fleet, can go up this far and can't go any further. And then there's other rivers, smaller rivers that you just can't navigate. Like this one over here in southern, you know, this is the Kanawha River that runs past uh, Charleston, Virginia. You can't navigate this thing. So I'm pretty sure this river cannot be navigated. However, let's, uh, let's give it a go. Because I don't know if I've ever actually tried. Can you come here? No. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just not a navigable river. However, this is kind of over, you know, these two. Let's get, uh, let's just move this gunboat down the, down the river a little bit. So, there you have it. Some rivers navigable, some not. And some rivers are navigable up to a certain point but then not all the way up to the tip or to the source. Now, whether those are historically accurate or not is a different question. Um, and for some of these rivers, it, they would be navigable at some time of the year and maybe not others. that it's not modeled to that level of granularity. So some of these are pretty arbitrary. Um, for example, I am, I am pretty sure that even in the 1860s, the Kanawha was probably navigable, at least by something like a ship's tender gumboat, um, at least as far up as Charleston, Virginia. This should probably be navigable. It, it just isn't in the game. And then, uh, the Tennessee River is navigable in game up to somewhere just below Knoxville but above Chattanooga. And I'm pretty sure I've read multiple accounts in different books that uh, Union gunboat fleets had a rough time, uh, you know, were not able to get all the way up the Tennessee as far as Chattanooga. Anyway, okay, so there you have it. Some rivers navigable, some not. Um, I covered that, I covered that, I put it. Okay, and then the, just the final thing is I have done a little bit of off-camera work. Um, over the last battle or two, there, there have been some observations that, hey, you missed that perk slot. Hey, you missed that perk slot. Hey. <laughs> and I do that a lot. Uh, I have gone through all of the armies and double-checked all the brigades, and I think, I think everyone who was eligible for a perk slot has got a perk now. And uh, I'm generally going with kind of a half-half for infantry, I'm generally going with kind of a half and half. Uh, I use uh, Iron Discipline on a lot of them, and then I use Sharpshooter on a lot of them. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I think those are the best two perks. Uh, I think they're very good. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I think that others aren't good as well. One 
<clears throat> for because part of what I think about is what is the effect, but the other thing to bear in mind is how fast is that perk going to level up? And what kind of actions and conditions um, influence that? And for example, one perk that is quite good and which is quite popular is Deadly Volley. Okay, it gives uh, some it gives some uh, additional firepower at short range, and it also increases the unit's resilience to uh, uh, sharp morale nerf, like canister fire. And so that's a great perk. I don't use it, and the reason I don't use it is because that perk only levels up when the unit engages in short-range engagements. Well, those just don't happen that often. And so, yeah, you can get that perk slot open and you can get the Tier 1 on the Deadly Volley, and then it's just not going to level up uh, past that Tier 1 uh, for the simple reason that the conditions which make it level up just are very situational and don't happen that much. And that's the reason I like Iron Discipline because basically it's level up, it's leveled up by engaging in ranged combat. It doesn't matter what range, right? If the unit is shooting, it's leveling up its perk. <laughs> and that happens all the time. Uh, and that's why I like the sharpshooter perk for things like uh, Mississippi Rifle Armed uh, Brigades because the vast majority of their shooting occurs at long range. And so the, it just levels up faster. <clears throat> and then the other thing I've done is we got our first batch of weapons delivered. Uh, infantry weapons. The reboard muskets that we uh, ordered a while back arrived. 25,000 of them. And I've got them farmed out to various brigades. Uh, there's like, you know, there's not enough left in the armory for a brigade. Even a small one. So as a result, all of the armies have got more rifles than they did. Um... Beauregard's army, the North Virginia army, and Johnston, Joe Johnston's Shenandoah army are now all rifle armed. Now some of them are reboards, so some of them are crappy rifles, but they're a lot better than muskets. And Price, every brigade in Price's army is, has now got at least a reboard musket. So no more muskets in this army either. And then the other armies have got more rifles than they did. So that's that's good. Okay. So what's our theater situation here? We'll go west to east. Still got these little brigades down in these Indian Territory and Arkansas forts. And they're still tiny. They're about 600 apiece. Um, so I'm just letting them grow through the rest of the winter. We'll see how big they are uh, in April 1862. Which I'm not really going to want them moving around and doing stuff uh, before then anyway because of the uh, winter attrition and so forth. Okay, Price is still holding his own here. Uh, he's back in supply. He is starting to recover some men, barely. <laughs> Um, but he's got his ammo back. He's in fine shape supply-wise. So he's just uh, kind of defensive here at Springfield. And we'll see how the Union lets us, uh, you know. Now right now, if he gets attacked by that Army of Indiana again, I'll probably just retreat him. But I'm not going to, you know, back down into Arkansas. But... Uh, He's going to hang here for now as long as the Union lets him. Oh, one other thing I forgot. Kind of tied to game options. I like to have the uh, telegraph lines and the supply lines on and the battle monuments off. The monuments just don't really add anything. And if there's a lot of stuff in an area, 
you know, they're and you're trying to find a tooltip, sometimes they get in the way. And then I just like to have the telegraph and supply on. Now these these only reverted back to default because I verified files. Recently, so I think in 1.06, they have fixed it now so that um, You know, if you if you load if you save and exit the game and then reload, uh, I've been finding recently that these stay persistent. So that's good. And these only changed, I think, because I verified files, which made everything go back to default. So that's a good recent change. And someone made a comment that in 1.07, Telegraph and Supply are now on by default anyway. So that's an even better change. Um, so that's what we're, that's the way things look in the Trans Mississippi. Uh, we have still got John, uh, Sidney Johnson's Army of Tennessee at Cairo, and he's building this fort, which only has 12 days left to go. And I would have moved him by now, except he was building this fort. As soon as that fort's done, I think he's going to have to get on the river and come back up to Louisville because we've got this uh, unspotted uh, Union Army over here somewhat close to Louisville. Did I move this scout? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Bragg is still besieging Fort Pickens down here. I don't think too much has changed. Uh-oh. That doesn't look good. Still showing it's going to be in his favor. However, notice that because of this siege, Bragg has actually dropped to... Oh, he, well, he's got a perk, though. but his readiness has dropped off. So he may just wind up retreating for low readiness soon. And if he does, that's not a disaster. We'll just send him back. <laughs> Let him regain readiness and send him back. And this is intended to be a recruiting command. So... Yeah, I said I checked perks earlier. I didn't check this command. Let's give him Siege Train. Can't hurt. That's what he's doing at the moment. And then, uh, you know, we're in winter, and basically these armies up here in Virginia are just keeping the Union honest. There are more Union armies up here that are not spotted, and altogether there are more Union troops right here. And so these armies aren't going anywhere. Right. And then finally, naval. Let's just have a look at our frigates. 97%. So very, very soon, they're going to go into action and start clearing this damn Yankee blockade. All right. Let's get time rolling. The only place where we see Union movement recently is right here in Kentucky. So let's kind of keep an eye on what's going on in here. The Intel report does say that they're conducting offensive operations. They've kind of slowed down in Missouri, at least for the moment. They're building a supply depot at Lebanon. Um, we do have a Union army moving around in here. There he is. Come book Psalm. And yeah, looks like he's headed to Louisville. Well, no, he's stopping here to build a supply depot. Okay, well, you know what? 
in the long run, that's good for us. Because <laughs> at some point, <clears throat> I would hope that that becomes a Confederate supply depot. Nice job there, whoever is commanding Army of Ohio. The Confederate Quartermaster General, appreciate your efforts. Because that's five and a half million I don't need to spend later. I still got to spend money to, you know, fill the thing up. But hopefully they'll fill it up with some nice uh, ammo for us as well. Nine days. Let's just double check Bragg's readiness. That may have been a time needs to advance thing. Nope, he's red. Okay. <laughs> And he's not just has fallen into there. I mean, he is just dead zero here. But he's fine on supply. His guys seem all right. They're, you know, I see a lot of eagers and confidence. It's all one stable in there. No one's actually asked about this. However, sometimes in these coastal fort sieges or right on the coastal, you'll get these weird, you know, like apparently Bragg is drawing supply from these nodes. He's getting a supply from Mexico and Great Britain and France. He's getting it by sea, internationally. I don't know how to explain that. It, it seems weird. It seems like it would come in to a port. I mean, it makes sense that, yeah, he may be getting stuff from that, but it seems like it would come into a port, you know, via an IIP, and then go to an army. That would make more sense. Not just directly from an international trade node like that. That seems odd. I'm not against the concept. It just seems to be implemented a little weird. That's all I'm saying. I know, by the way, when this force removes this blockade fleet, he's going to come up here and remove this one, too. We found out in the last campaign, I was a little bit surprised at how far up the Potomac uh, seagoing vessels can go. It makes sense. Potomac's a pretty wide river through here. I just didn't know that the game let seagoing ships uh, go this far. And actually, I bet even just a couple days, these frigates may. Nope. <laughs> They've reached 100%, but they're not. They're, they're like 99.8 or something. They're still not quite available. <clears throat> Four days left on the fort. Any movement over here in Missouri? No. Army of Indiana. Not visible, but obviously he's here because he's building the supply depot. And that'll take ten more days. And he may move right in on price again. I'm semi-tempted, if I have to retreat, I'm semi-tempted to burn this supply depot down. Okay, we have our Tariff Act. I think that's going to help economically. Okay. Alright, I'm pretty happy with where the volunteer manpower pool is. Right? Uh, available troops is no longer a limiting factor in recruiting any more brigades. What is a limiting factor is weapons, available weapons, and um, just plain old cost. But bottom line is I am feeling no need to pursue uh, Militia Act 3 anytime in the near future. I think this tariff act helps and uh, I could go impressment 
which does provide even more manpower, but cost of supplies minus 20%. That sounds really good. Uh, I know I don't want to do print notes. That just trashes... Uh, that just trashes private wealth. I'm actually not against uh, Regulars Act, and I will probably take it at some point. The one thing that I, I don't think I want to do it now because the downside of this act, uh, the units that, get, that you get with it are pretty good, but uh, the, well, they're not just pretty good. They're really about the best you can get. They come with max training. They come with a perk slot already open for you. Um, so this is worth doing, but it costs minus five military experience. Now, I'm not a fan of that. And right now, our military experience is only two above the unions, 24 or 22. So, so, you know, if I take it, then that's going to put our military experience at 19. And now our, our training rates and our leader's attributes improvement will be below Billy Yanks. So I think I'm going to hold that for later. And once we get up, you know, with a gap of you know, five or six or seven, maybe that might be a good time to take the regulars act. I think I'm interested in King Cotton. I think I'm interested in industrialization. Um, I don't normally take Diplomacy 1 just because the main thing on this line is European relations and I don't really care about that. However, I think I'm interested in improving our diplomacy subsidies because kind of part of my economic strategy that I'm trying in this game, I'm not saying this is the way to play the economy, but what I'm trying in this game is an, kind of a, as an experiment, see how it works out, is uh, improving our international trade by lifting the blockade, buffing the ports with markets, and that ties in with Tariff Act because tariffs are levied on international trade. So I think I'd like to get some more diplomacy subsidy money flowing in order to increase the rate at which we take trade deals levels. So I think I'm going to take di Diplomacy uh, 1. Let me just double check down here in Chapter 2. Yeah, I don't want bounties. Um, now I'm going to hold off. I probably will take Diplomacy 1 fairly soon, but for now I'm going to take Impressment. The main drawback of impressment is you get a minus three support. Uh, our support's pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and take impressment. We're at, uh, well, maybe I lied there. We're down to 89 average. But you know what? That, that, that number, that is primarily because of Kentucky which is quite low because it recently seceded and the Union still owns a lot of it. So Kentucky being 36% drags down that average. I mean, support in most of the states is super high. 98, 97, 98. So yeah, we're fine. Uh, Virginia is a little bit of a concern. 71%.
And the in episode one, I talked about the strategy of letting the Union go ahead and take West Virginia so that it becomes a separate state and that fighting and Union-controlled IIPs don't count against Virginia proper. Well, that little strategy is just not working out because even though I've vacated Western Virginia here, the, the Union just hasn't made a move to... Oh, time's running. The Union just hasn't made a move to take Charleston, Virginia. And so, you know, this is all counting against Virginia. So that didn't really work out. Or it has not so far, anyway. Looks like I built something. Ah, okay, the fort's done. Which means... Turn that on. Even though it's wintertime, I think Johnson needs to get back on the river. Come back up to Louisville. Yeah, well, yeah, he does. This is a separate army. This is the Army of the West, which is now with the 80... These guys started in Missouri and have come all the way over here. And they're... But they just stopped on the... Uh, is this Ohio or... Yeah, Indiana. They just stopped on the Indiana side of the river and are building a supply depot. Have not crossed the river to... Louisville. And then this army is still over here. Okay. Johnson needs to come back up. <laughs> Regardless. And let's just have him come down and... Yeah, that's fine. Meanwhile, now this is a fairly important fort, and this fort probably is likely to be besieged uh, at some point, maybe multiple times. And I've talked before about how, yeah, the, the, the Union's not going to attack these forts over here. They've got units in them, and I'm just going to pull them out. And the same in the Indian Territory, right? All those little brigades aren't going to stay in there. Okay, that's not the case with this fort. I think I do want some forces in here. Um, and I probably want a f fairly decent commander. This is Fort Frank. I actually need to get to it this way. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think Lieutenant Colonel Francis Branch with no face is going to, going to cut it here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a political officer here, too, but I think I have some decent ones. That doesn't look, that doesn't look right. That seems like a lot of political officers available. What do we have for Virginia? Not much. I thought I put Harper in command somewhere. No? I was just talking about him, I guess. Let's put Kenton Harper in command of this fort. Let's, uh, I'm going to put uh, two infantry brigades and two artillery battalions in here. Let's 
What have we got room for? 5,000? Okay, I don't need Hardy in there. Seth Barton will do. And Bernard B will do. Makes his unit better in siege warfare. Uh, you know what? If that's if that's true, instead of Harper, let's find an engineer to command this fort. I don't think I actually have very many engineers. Let's go with Mouton. And I don't have any rifles to give them. And even if I did, I'm not sure that I would give them to uh, Fort Garrison. But let's give them, uh, see if I have any. I'll at least give them Springfield muskets. I'm really not sure how much the weapons quality plays into the Siege Warfare Auto Resolves calculations. I don't know. I don't really have any guns to give these guys other than six pounders. Well, I could give them 12 pound howitzers. Again, I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, I have read people's comments saying that they think howitzers are better for siege warfare. I'm not going to use these things anywhere else, so sure, let's give them some howitzers. Okay, so we've got a pretty substantial force for a fort garrison, right? It's got a capacity of 5,000, 4,900 men. That's going to take them a while to get there. 14 days, 14 days. But the idea is... Um, now, does that make this fort really uh, able to hold up against anybody? No. If a full ar you know, if a full size army comes down here and besieges this fort, it's still gonna fall. However, some of these small you know, like this Army of the West, which has eighty five hundred men, they've got some smaller armies. Um, you know, these guys, Cumberland, twenty nine hundred these armies can't just roll up and take this fort. Um and even if it is a larger force, having a substantial garrison in it uh, may force a larger army to take longer and give us more time to get a proper army over there to help out. That's my idea. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Forts, I've seen forts hold out for a long time, even with a much smaller garrison. And then sometimes the other, in some I've even seen forts win uh, a siege with just the 50-man garrison. That's not that common, though. What is more common is that the enemy force rolls up and immediately goes into not siege, but assault. And the fort just lasts a couple days. So I'm kind of hoping that with a substantial garrison, they can actually beat and, and uh, you know, successfully defend against one of these smaller armies. 
and against a larger army, at least make it go into siege, not assault. Whether the AI cooperates, well, we'll just see how it works out. Okay. Other than this right around in Kentucky, Union really isn't doing much, and I'm not doing much, uh, because it's winter. I certainly don't want Price moving any more than he absolutely... Oh, he's got a... Let's get that ambulance corps on him. <laughs> I checked all of his brigades for perk slots, and I didn't check the army. <laughs> Okay. Oh, he's back up almost to 12,000 men now. Have those artillery battalions shown up? They have. He's got a lot more guns. So that's good. Uh, Army of the Mississippi is moving in on him. Army of the Mississippi is smaller, though. Okay, Union's gone confiscation. That makes sense. That's a, that's a pretty good policy on the Union side. I like taking that as Union. It's kind of their counterpart to the Impressment Act on our side that we're working on now. Now, Price can beat these guys. This is the smaller of the two armies. So let's just see how this turns out. If this army is reinforced by the Army of the Indiana, I'm probably just going to withdraw. If it is not, I think we'll fight that battle. And I don't I don't think he's in reinforcement range. Before this happens <laughs> because if I don't do it I may forget later and this is the downside to the lower scroll speed but okay I think our yeah our frigates are ready and so Scout Ron 1 is this little uh yeah, that's right now. It's just a, well, it's a scout run. It's just one little ship's tender gunboat, and it is about to be something else. And I'm doing it this way because I can't actually form a new fleet right now in Gosport because it is blockaded. You can't form a new fleet. But I have an existing fleet. And, yeah, this gumbo doesn't need to be here anymore. Go back into the reserve gumboats. Okay, so now, obviously it's not a scout run anymore. This is the CSA Battle Squadron. Actually, CSN, it would be CSN, wouldn't it? Confederate States Navy. And I think we can probably find a better commander than this. Somebody like... Okay, something's not right here. That's better. Buchanan. He's on the short list for command of this. Or Sims. I don't know if these 
attributes really matter that much for the auto-resolve naval battles. I've read that cunning helps with things like blockade and vision, but that's not really what this force is about. I'm going to go with Franklin Buchanan. Do we have any, any other sleepers in here? Nah. Yeah, I think Sims and Buchanan are pretty much the, the best we got. Alright, Franklin Buchanan. Okay. So it's, it's going to take a little time for these ships to actually get there, and uh, he'll probably have to come up and ready. Well, I don't know. He may be fine for readiness as it is when they arrive, or he may have to regain readiness again with all the new units. But I just wanted to make sure I got that squadron formed before we uh, had contact here. This is going to be the second battle of Springfield. How's Johnston? The other, you know, how's Sidney Johnston doing? He's still headed up the river. Okay. I forgot who... Uh, Fremont, right? I think Fremont is commanding this army. This is the army where we kind of had the staring contest for six days. <laughs> Yeah, okay, he is not reinforced, and we've got an enormous uh, advantage in guns. In type as well, none of these are six pounders. We've got one battalion of 24 pound howitzers and three battalions of 12 pound Napoleons. So I think that this. This is probably going to go just fine, even though Sterling Price is at low readiness, but he's got all of his supplies, his uh, morale looks okay. Um, so, I think this is going to go just fine. However, I believe that this battle is going to be the content of the next episode. Um, we've been running about an hour in this one, and uh, so... The second battle of Springfield will be next time. But I'll, I'll post the videos probably around the same time. I'm not going <laughs> to... You don't have to wait a day. So, if you like what we're doing with this channel, if you like the content, then leave a like. Uh, leave a comment. Maybe even subscribe. Uh, if you're new to the channel, if you're new to the series, uh, and would, would like to see what has transpired in this campaign up till now, uh, I've got a. I'm going to link a playlist right here, so you can go back and catch up. Uh, but at any rate, thank you all very. I want to make one other comment. Uh, you know, I I am not aspiring to be a quote YouTuber unquote. <laughs> this isn't this isn't my job. I'm not. But it's just really nice that there's people out there who are interested in this. And you know that I'm making some stuff here. I'm just posting my gameplay on the on the YouTube, and some and that there's people who like watching it. And I really, really appreciate that, and it, it motivates me to go back and do more of these. And uh, why am I mentioning that? Because um, uh, just in the last few hours, uh, this channel has has passed uh, 500 subscribers. Which, you know, kind of in the big picture on YouTube, is still super, super tiny. <laughs> but it's a big number to me, and I really appreciate you guys. And so, you know, when I say uh, thank you very much for watching, I really do appreciate it. I really mean it. Alright, see you next time for the Battle of Springfield.